What's up, guys? Harry here, Zero's Geckos, vlog number nine. This week, there isn't Gecko Pod. We missed last week, too. Well, last week was more of a break. Normally, we do three weeks on, one week off, and then we three weeks on, one week off, but we're taking an extra week break. We've just been kind of tired, and we're trying to figure out some scheduling stuff. Apologies that there is not another Gecko Pod episode this week. Instead, I'm going to do a vlog. Might not be as cool as the Gecko Pod where we interview all these other people and get their insight, but for the new breeders, we can chat here and hang out for a little bit. First things first, let me update you guys on my website and the auction. So coming to my website, going to the feature tab. So last week I posted this vlog and I shared with you guys that I was launching this auction feature here. So far I've did back-to-back -back auctions for three days each. And I sold both of those. The first one was, an har both of them were Harleys. The first one was a male. That one went for 170. It was, I think it was like a 16 gram Harley male. And then right after that, I posted up a 16 gram, 17 gram Harley female. That one sold for 270. That one went to Jake in Colorado. Malawi Exotics, shout out to you, thank you. The first one went to Patrick, Laguna OC Exotics, SoCal. And then this is my third one, back to back to back. This one's a quad stripe, some good white wall. It's a full pin, seven gram male. And this one isn't as popular, it seems. This one's only at $70 right now from Simon. This ends on Valentine's Day, Wednesday at 6 p.m. But the first two auctions did actually really well. I'm surprised that there's so much action going on. So I was pretty encouraged by that. And then this one, not as much action here, but still it's okay. So Simon, if you win this one, it's a steal, $70. This one's pretty clean. But yeah, I think this is pretty cool, pretty simple feature on my website. So the goal was to funnel people towards my website. And I realized that it just kind of takes time to build an audience to build your base build your platform and i felt comfortable enough to to know that if i were to post this up on ig that there would be a decent amount of traction and sure enough there was some good action going on but i don't believe that anyone can just kind of copy and paste and do the same thing and already i saw a few i saw at least one person kind of copy um this format exactly almost and that's okay. I mean, you could do what you guys want to do. If you guys find inspiration from the stuff I do, feel free to try to take it and steal it and make it better. I'm not mad. Just put your spin to it. Uh, it doesn't have to be like down to the T exactly how I'm doing it. But I mean, even if it is, it's fine. I'm not threatened by that, mainly because I want to see you guys do well. But also, I know the hard work on the back end side of how long it takes to build out an audience and a platform. So that is actually the hardest work. Anybody can copy and paste and do anything I'm doing, but how do you get an audience? How do you get customers? How do you get a community behind you? That is the hard work. And this is why I keep telling you guys to build your base, make the connections, talk to people, find your group of breeder friends and just collaborate and do stuff together be cool with people there's not it's not about a rivalry or this group is and this click is better than that click it's about collaboration it's about being cool with people within the community not causing too many waves negative waves but if there's positivity and good vibes then yeah i mean share all that stuff out so i just wanted to share that update with you guys that the auction is something that i'm really enjoying so far and hopefully as more and more traction is built into this page and this feature, I can begin to branch out and bring other people into these kind of auctions. And again, I don't know how that's going to look like exactly. I do wanna use this platform to kind of help other people and to help lift others up. So stay tuned for that. I don't know how soon I'm gonna get that going, but first I need to build this consistency so that people know to come to my website, to come to this, auction and know that on almost every single day there's going to be some action going on i took a poll uh, about what is your preferred auction length and a huge majority it was a tie between one day and two day 24 hours and 48 hours 
the third day dropped off significantly. So I cut my three day down to two day. And if there's enough traction from two day, maybe eventually I'll cut it down to one day. One day is actually not very long at all for people to get their eyes on the animal. So let me show you guys some of the back end workings of, of everything. So on my Instagram page, I just wanted to show you guys how, how many eyes, how many people saw this post, this post about this gecko, this featured auction gecko. I posted that yesterday, Sunday or Monday, and now it just ended out of 5,000 followers, 544 people saw the post. So let's say 10%, right? 10% people saw my Instagram story and that hopefully funneled some people to my website. Not everyone's going to click your stuff, right? So you got to kind of track a bit of the analytics to see how things trend and how things do. So I'm, I'm not sure what the proper uh, metric is to see how well it did, but 10% people viewed that story. Let's say another 10%. Let, let's make it, let's be generous. Let's say 20%. Of that, of those people, out of five hundred people, clicked on the link and saw this web page, right, and saw this featured gecko. Uh, that's a hundred people. It kind of slowly filters and funnels. It's all a numbers game. We're all just trying to get more and more people to kind of see our stuff. So even with the following, the small, quote unquote, small following that I have as a new breeder, even then the stories get less views than one might think. And then the click rate on that is significantly lower than what your actual views are. So I understand as I'm kind of growing my platform and my socials that if you only have 500 followers, you're not going to get that much traction. If you only have 1,000 followers, 2,000 followers, you're not going to get that much traction. And I know in the, my last vlog, I said, you know, the numbers don't matter. And to some degree, they don't. But what I mean by the numbers don't matter is that don't be so focused on the numbers that it cripples you from doing good quality work. You know, sometimes we'll just chase followers just to chase followers and we're doing all these crazy posts. My point is that, yes, numbers do to some degree matter, but don't be so focused on the numbers. Just do good work and be patient. That's what it is. Good work plus patience will build out your following. I'm not good at taking shortcuts when it comes to building things out. Like I'm much slower on posts. I'm much slower on reels and being consistent with those things. What I'm good at is making connections, talking to people, even for this. I like doing these vlogs. I actually really enjoy talking to a camera. It's fun to me. And even the gecko pod. I love talking to people. So that is my strength. That is my skill set is to talk to people, to talk to people through DMs, to make these vlogs so that more people can see the content more people can learn more people can grow and so naturally i like i like making connections and i like to share information and so to some degree there's this aspect of teaching in my past jobs i did a lot of teaching and so i just kind of enjoy that aspect of it but with where i'm at there's also still a lot of learning and growth and things that i don't know that i still am hungry to learn and so in that i'm learning with you um, even though I feel like I can teach a lot of things and help with a lot of aspects of breeding and the hobby for new breeders, I'm very much still learning with you guys. So there's that. There's the auction update. There is a lot more potential I feel like I can do with it. But for now, I'm going to keep building momentum for it every day, as back to back to back. I'm just going to continue dropping animals, auction after auction after auction. And so in that sense, it'll allow people to just always come to it. So bookmark the page, share it with your friends, and we'll build the thing out together. It hopefully will benefit many people as they get animals on the cheap. This animal right here is a nice animal. It's 70 bucks right now. So hopefully this benefits you. And as I put more animals up, it'll continue to build that momentum. And perhaps I can begin to kind of rearrange the page so that I can have my auction animal up and also maybe another breeder's auction animal as well that I can help curate and select and pick. And in that sense, we can build more momentum for new breeders. I don't want to just put up random animals though. I do want to see new breeders produce quality and good things. 
So when we think about auction animals, sometimes we think mid tier, low tier, but it doesn't have to be like that. I feel like auction animals can be nice. So if we can continue to up the quality of auction animals and people can still grab them for a good price, that's a good middle ground for the seller and the buyer. AJ and Gabby actually do a pretty good job with this with their um, online auctions. They have YouTube auctions every two weeks and they just hammer out auction animals and list uh, auction animals for like two to three hours. You can get some really nice stuff off of those auctions. And that's probably not even their best stuff. I don't think it's their best stuff. I've seen, obviously, I've seen AJ's animals and he has some very high quality stuff. But for his auctions, his quality of animals is already like pretty good, even for his low and mid tier. So even when he auctions items, they're pretty good animals. Gabby obviously has some of the best tries. She collects everybody's best tries and then she breeds them and she makes some really nice stuff. And she has all of those for auction. Some of these things are at such a great price right now. And I know it hurts. It stings them to kind of sell at these prices, but the buyers are definitely benefiting from a lot of those animals. And so for me, what I'm doing with this auction, I'm selling what one at a time, <laughs> one every two, three days uh, when they're selling, I don't know, 40, <laughs> 20 to 40 animals a night, but every other week. But for me, this is still helpful. You know, I don't have nearly as many animals as those guys, but I'm able to still move things if I sell consistently via this feature. So, so far I'm encouraged and hopefully this will continue to grow. But going back to the platform and the base, this won't work for everybody. Maybe at least at the stage at, that you're in, but you should still try. Uh, to do things, be creative with things, find ways to market and sell, but just know that patience, a lot of patience is required. The crested gecko hobby and business is not a get rich quick type of scheme at all. Remember, I'm in my third year in and I spent a lot of time on building all of this stuff out. It takes time. So don't be surprised if you do some of these things your first year and you don't get a lot of traction. Don't be too discouraged. That's just part of the game. I still see some new breeders that collect a bunch of stuff and while they're breeding they go to show still and they'll sell off things that uh, don't fit their projects anymore you can also do that you can buy wholesale packs from bigger breeders you can ask even smaller breeders mid-tier breeders uh, if they have wholesale packs to give and you can buy their stuff and you can sell those at the shows a couple breeders have messaged me recently asking if i had any animals for wholesale and i thought maybe that's a good way for me to move stuff and I could definitely do that. You know, I have all my hatchling racks over there that's fairly full still that I can move. But I also feel like I didn't want to sell things for 20 bucks a piece, 30 bucks a piece. Um, even if it was up to 50 bucks a piece, I feel like I can sell things at a higher price. So even if I were to do these auctions, let's say I do every two days, I put up an animal. Every two days, I sell an animal. So I'll sell three geckos a week, even if it sells low at this price, right? Right now, 70 bucks. I'm just going to assume that this won't sell higher than I hope that it would. But let's just say 70 bucks. Let's say 100 bucks. Let's say I sell this animal for 100 bucks. The last one I sold for 270. The one before that I sold for 170. So when I sell animals, I kind of think in terms of like, okay, how much, how much per gecko on average can I sell? If I can do $200 an animal on average, even with kind of my higher end stuff, it ends up being like 200 bucks per gecko average. I would be okay with that. Obviously, want to continue to increase those numbers, either quantity or the price point. We all start somewhere. So that's kind of my range right now. If I could hit $200 a gecko on average um, per sale, then I would be okay with that. Let's say three animals at 200 bucks, 600 bucks a week, uh, four animals, 800 bucks. Set a goal and find ways to kind of hit those numbers. What's cool also is that as the quality of your stock increases, well, so will your numbers. So even though some of these things I feel like are cheaper, I still feel like they're pretty good animals and it's only going to be better. So all the stuff I'm breeding should produce hopefully some even better things than what I have at the moment. This year, I'm also producing a lot of different morphs. I'm not sure if AJ wanted us to share, but my female group that I sent to AJ, my pixel female, 
my exantic female, my cappuccino female, those females are being collabed to his sable lily white. So we'll be making some stack genes, stack morphs this season. So we should have some pretty good stuff coming up. I do believe that morph stacking is going to be the future, but there is still plenty and plenty of room to build out all of the base things that are still good. So my main project, as some of you guys know, is the high white stuff, the high coverage stuff. I'm trying to get it as white as possible. And that is the project that I've been spending a lot of time and energy and focus and intention on. So that is always going to be kind of my base project that I'm going to be working on. So don't neglect your base project, but also keep an eye on the morphs. As the prices come down and lower, make sure to grab a few things here and there and just grow it out. That'll kind of shore up your projects as you progress in the hobby, assuming that you make it through the first two to three years. A lot of people drop out, so hang tight. <laughs> Be patient. I move my microphone off my shirt so it doesn't keep wobbling over here. And I put it right in front of me on a stand right here. Another thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is starting projects. How can you build and develop your projects? And what I would say is that don't start from scratch. Sure, you can start um, from scratch and take out all the traits and the base morph that you want and then slowly build it out and take generations and years to kind of build what you want that's fine but understand that that's going to take years and generations to kind of build and craft that animal by then you're going to be you might be bored of whatever you're going to try to make so instead instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and starting from scratch just buy things that already resemble what you want buy things that are the base morph that you want buy things that have the traits that you want and Spend a premium if you need to. Spend a premium to buy the animal that you want to almost replicate in some sense and then build off of that. Find breeders that already have animals that you want and pay extra for that. That is money that I feel like is worthwhile. Again, don't overpay. Make sure you ask your breeder friends and people that are more experienced in the hobby if the price is good and if you should pursue certain animals. But once you find an animal that you want and you're able to find offspring from the animal that replicates some of those traits, then go ahead and inquire about that animal. One of the first animals that I got was my Felix Julia. It was Hyperion right here. Hyperion, I grew as a baby and it developed nicely. But when what I did was before I knew AJ very well, I saw his page and I was drawn to his Frostline stuff. Back then, he didn't call it Frostline. It wasn't even the line that he named yet. But he had these high coverage, high white, creamy, not just creamy white, but he had some actual pretty white, white animals that are very covered and had like nice, clean, consistent patterning. And so I messaged AJ and said, hey, do you have any animals that are like this for sale? And eventually, he sent me a bunch of pictures with Felix Julia kids. I knew I wanted a male and I chose this one. I chose this one. I think it was like four or five grams. And eventually it took us and it took me a season to grow it out, but it's been breeding. It bred all of last year and it's breeding for me again this year. And he is a stud. Hyperion gets the job done. He produces really nice kids. And it's because I wanted um, this high white, high coverage pattern here on the sides, on the laterals. And I really liked this patterning that kind of pops out this harley patterning that pops out could have cleaner pattern and more consistent pattern which aj does have but for this animal it's pretty good so i paired hyperion to one of them was koala and koala also has high coverage but it's more of a creamy a little bit more yellow yellow creamy rather than white cream but the coverage is there it's a little bit drippy and um it made some pretty good animals, some pretty good offspring. Another one I paired to Hyperion was this one, Cali. Cali is also from AJ. It's an Emerald Paramount. And I paired it because of its structure, its crests. And it also has a bit of tricolor in it. You can see kind of this orange pattern popping out. So it's not just a black and white animal, but it does have some tricolor influence. And actually, Hyperion. 
produce some other tricolors from other animals. So there is some tricoloring influence when it comes to Hyperion as well. So I put those together. I put Hyperion and I put Cali. And let me show you what popped out. One of the offspring that popped out was this thing. You see it adopted a lot of the good traits from both parents. It has some nice white pins. It has some really good side white, a lot of white spotting going on. You kind of see that what we call white spot or, you know, we talked about it before, snowflake. It's kind of blooming and spreading. It's the obvious tricolor. You have the orange patterning popping out. You have the white patterning popping out and it's on a dark base. It has some cool crest. The crest could be better, but the crest is mainly my fault from probably incubating a little bit too hot. But that should be fixed from future animals this coming season. But if you take a look, this is a really nice animal. Like this thing is legit. Like this popped out of some animals that I thought were cool and it adopted a lot of the traits that I like. So I wasn't necessarily going for the tricoloring. It wasn't until I started popping these that I noticed that, okay, there's some tricoloring in, in some of this line and you get that, but this pairing turned out nicer than I thought it would. I really wanted that side white the white spotting and it delivered. So this one is Hyperion and Cali Girl. I also made produced one that was more black and white. I think that one was probably my favorite one. That was the best one. That was a hold back. I didn't sell it. I, that one went to Alex. I wish I had pictures of it, but I can ask Alex for some pictures and I'll show you guys sometime. But that's an example of pairing two animals that you want for its traits and its morphs and combining them and producing some nicer stuff. Obviously, sometimes you'll get some really nice animals, a nice stud male and a female that are amazing, and you can still produce some mid stuff. That, that happens in almost all breeders, right? It's all about probabilities. But when you pair nicer stuff, it's about a higher probability that you're gonna get nicer stuff. And so when you're starting your projects, don't start from bare bones scratch. Don't get animals that you don't want, if that makes sense. Okay? Don't get in a male and be like, oh, I can improve on XYZ quality and then, you know, just breed it to whatever and then take several generations to fix that thing that you don't want. No, like for starters, if you want to save time as new breeders, just save your money and spend on an animal that you actually really love and you like that you know you don't have to necessarily breed anything out or fix anything on a major scale. So even Hyperion right here, it's pretty good. Like I feel like this is maybe 85% of what I would want my animals to eventually look like. I want it to be higher white. I want it the uh, patterning to be a little bit more consistent. It's pretty close. So try to get as close as possible to the animal that you want and try to replicate that. Okay, so that's one example of that tricolor, but let me show you another hyperion animal okay so here is a hyperion female it adopted a lot of that high coverage it's a little bit creamier than i'd like but it's not too bad this one is a hyperion and koala female so remember this is hyperion and koala is right here so those two produced this thing like not bad like it's not bad for Gen 1 stuff. Like the crest is there. The crest isn't bad. And this one's not fired up, but when it fires up, you can see more of the contrast of the black and white. But yeah, this one's not too bad. The patterning could be cleaned up though, right? The patterning isn't as clean and as consistent as, you know, I would eventually want it, but it's there. It's not, it's also not as drippy as. I would prefer. So remember the drippiness is the white spotting that comes off of um, right below the pinstripe. So this one lacks that a little bit. You could see that it's a little drippy, right? Right on its sides, you could see some drips, but it's not a full on drip. And then it's mom, koala. You can also see there's a little drip on the back right here, but over here, maybe just a couple of spots here and there, but it's not very, very drippy. And so those two animals made this, which is also not 
super drippy. But nonetheless, it's still pretty cool. So this animal is, is this high coverage, creamy white, has a bit of orange patterning going on too. Probably because both animals have some tricolor in its blood. Another example of a pairing is Toshi and Panko. That's this kid. This is Toshi. Toshi is also a high coverage, fairly white, more of a creamy white, but the patterning is really cool. You can see, you can really see that the white patterning, the white spotting, it breaks up a lot of that base color. And so there's a lot of coverage going on here. And I paired Toshi last year to Panko. Panko is a lily white, also a high expression lily white. Pretty good lily white coverage on here. You get the idea. And those two, Toshi and Panko, created this thing. So this one is a very high coverage. You see that white patterning is really, really covering this animal. Right now it's more of a creamy white. It's not white white, but it's still it's still pretty small. This is probably like five grams. So there's still quite a bit of developing it'll do. So hopefully it gets a little bit more white, actually a lot more white as it grows. You can see that the base color is dark and it's almost covered in pattern. So definitely don't start from scratch. Find animals that where breeders have already done a lot of the work for you and get those and stack them up with other lines and other traits that you want to see and then you'll develop things quicker if you start from scratch you're just going to develop a lot of mid stuff all the way throughout your time of reaching your target animal so how i would improve on this animal is that yes i like the coverage on this but i also want to see it wider and i would like to see the pattern the patterning be a little bit more consistent Right now you can see the patterning is just kind of like all scattered and random and all over the place. That's fine if you like it, but for me, I want to see more consistent and clean patterning. So there's that very cool animal. Hopefully I can continue to produce and take a few generations to kind of clean up all those things and make an animal that I'll be proud of. And it's not that I'm not proud of these, but, but just to be able to stack up some genes and clean up the patterning, get more white, so that's why it's important to find a good base animal and don't start from scratch scratch. Take the work of other past breeders and just stack on top of those things and make it even better. Some more basic things to discuss. What happens when you get an animal and it doesn't eat? We know that animals a lot of times will take some time to acclimate to its new environment. So that's no problem. Give it a week, give it a two weeks, no problem. Even if it doesn't eat for during that time, like no need to freak out. But what can help the animal also is to understand what the previous breeder fed it. Was it Pangea? Was it Rapashi? What flavor was it? Did they mix anything into it? Sometimes the geckos will get used to the diet. It's being fed for a couple seasons or from since hatch. And once it's introduced to other stuff, it doesn't immediately eat it right away. And this can cause new breeders to worry, but give it some time. It won't starve itself to death. Just make sure you offer food every three, four days of a diet that will be that it will be more inclined to eat. So for me, I feed Pangea fig and insect. I put a little bit of bee pollen and a little bit of honey just to sweeten it a little bit to give uh, a better response. And so far, my animals have enjoyed that mixture. I also mix crickets in and I blend it all together. And so if I ship you animals and you don't, and you receive it and it doesn't eat right away, don't be alarmed. It'll be okay. Just give it some time to acclimate. Another variable to be aware of is the size of the enclosure. If I send you a seven gram male that's been in the six quart enclosure and you put it in a 20 quart or you put it in a 12, 12, 18 like this, chances are good that the feeding response of whatever you're trying to feed it, it's going to go down. It's going to be it's going to have a harder time to eat and look for its food it's going to hide more and again that's not always the case but more often than not that's what i hear and that's what i've experienced myself when i bought my first crested gecko it was tiny it was four grams 
four or five grams from the local reptile store. The person at the front was just trying to sell me stuff, right? And so he sold me. He's like, I said, oh, what size enclosure should I put this animal in? He's like, oh, yeah, it'll be fine if you get one of these 12, 12, 18s or even a 12, 12, 24. So I bought one of those. I bought a 12, 12, 24 and I put my tiny gecko in there. And man, it took forever to grow. I'm telling you, it. I didn't understand why it wasn't growing. And it's because the enclosure was too freaking big. The kid that sold me that obviously didn't know what he was doing. The care information they gave me was pretty poor. So keep that in mind. If you're putting an animal that you got from a show or another breeder and it's small, make sure the enclosure is of proper size. So you could throw a seven gram into this, into a smaller, smaller exoterra. You could put that gecko in a smaller exoterra, or you could even if you put them in one of these stair lights. This is from Target. This costs only $2, 250 maybe. And I just drill hole in, holes in this. So for longest time, this is, this is these were one of my grow outs, um, grow out tubs. I would just have these stacked up along the walls and I would grow out animals from these bins. So those are some of the variables. It takes some time to acclimate to a new environment. Check the food that you're giving it. Ask the breeder what it, you fed it. Ask the breeder what they fed it. And then you can kind of mimic that. And then also enclosure size. Make sure it's an appropriate size enclosure for the gecko so it doesn't just wander off hiding all the time and not being able to find the food as easily something i also wanted to bring up was my recap um, of robin at red light shipping what i liked about the episode even though he didn't talk about really geckos or animals as much he talked more just about the industry but my favorite thing that that robin talked about was just this aspect of growing a business he talked about um, entrepreneurship and how he hustled from how, and how he's always just loved being an entrepreneur, loved starting businesses and really putting in the work to grind and do what it takes to become successful in business. Success in business doesn't always equate to being like just a millionaire making a ton of money. Sure, that's a goal. But being successful just means being happy with what you're doing, being happy and content with the work you're doing, the projects you're doing, um, being able to help other people. So I appreciated that about Robin and how he started even the reptile report to highlight smaller breeders, to give them a bit of a platform. And that really hit home for me because we all started as new breeders. We all started with a scrappy collection we all started with just a thousand bucks in our pockets trying to make it and we kind of work our way up and i actually really love that i love that we all start from scratch what we're trying to teach each other and encourage each other in is to hustle don't be lazy don't half ass your work but hustle do the work robin mentioned tristan that gecko junkie and it's true man that guy works so much tristan probably almost works too hard for his own good. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm just saying that he works hard. It is possible to work too hard to the detriment of your family. I've done that for several years of just working countless hours. I've missed a lot of my kids stuff on the weekends. And that is, I feel like is too much. And so, so it is important to yes, hustle and work hard, but do not kill yourself. Don't do it to the detriment of your health or your relationships. Make sure you have a good balance. With that said though, in general, I do feel like most of us, most of the community can work harder. Complain less, work harder, and show people, show people not by just your words, but but by your work ethic, by the things you produce, by the things that you're doing in the community. People will see your work and they will appreciate it. If you just complain all the time, you just get step into drama all the time, and you don't have anything to show for it, that's very telling of your work ethic. So it's vitally important to ingrain in yourself a very good work ethic, to be more systematic in kind of your work processes and your workflows, to not shy away from being bold and reaching out to people and talking to people. And even when you're discouraged, we all get discouraged and we all have sad days, but even then just get through it, do the work 
and be consistent with what you're doing. I love working with people that hustle. I love working with people that don't complain very much, but just put in the work and hustle. There are a lot of good breeders that are quiet, that don't say anything and just do the work. And that's awesome. And if you want to elevate even further, you can be more outspoken, not negatively, but positively. You can be for the community. You can be the voice for people. You can be be a voice and a platform that lifts people up. That is what I want to be around and people I want to be around. So breeders that help other breeders, even when they don't have to. Breeders that go out of their way to lift others up. Breeders that stay out of the drama. The cool thing about this hobby is that Whatever your flavor of personality is, you can kind of veer towards those things. And so everything that I just said, that's just my own thing and my own preference that I like. But if you want to be loud and um, be more bold and be more of the type that calls people out for the sake of the hobby, then, then that's okay too. But understand, as new breeders, it's always good to kind of pay your dues. And by that, I don't mean that you have to kiss ass. Don't kiss anyone's ass. Nobody deserves nobody deserves your affection. Like You don't have to like anybody. But pay your dues with your work ethic, with your patience, with hustling and grinding and taking the one, the two, the three seasons as a new breeder to just do the work, grind it out. Even when you're discouraged, keep your head up and show people by your work that you are a legit breeder. If you're a hobbyist and you're just doing this for fun, maybe spending five hours on cleaning a week and that's it, and just having fun in socials, that's awesome. Just know what the expectations are in that role. If you're only a year in and you only have 10 animals and you're bitching about how other people are doing things, no one's going to listen to you. It doesn't mean you can't have a voice, but what I mean is that you have to pay your dues. You have to show people that you're a legit breeder. A lot of people come and go in this hobby and they're just noise. They just make noise. They cause a fuss and then they flame out a year and a half later. Like people aren't going to listen to those people. If you're going to be a legit breeder, just stay the course. Provide and give to the community rather than just chirp and make noise. Show people with your work and your work ethic that you are a legit breeder. All the big breeders before us have seen countless numbers of hobbyists and breeders come in and out of the hobby like nothing. So us being in this hobby together right now, as you're watching this video, as you're watching the Gecko Pod, know the expectations. If you want to last in this hobby, just put in the work, put in the work, be less noisy at the beginning. And as you kind of grow and develop your platform, then you could speak up on various things as you go. But it would be wise if you don't speak on things you don't necessarily know about, and you're just trying to ride the wave of other breeders being loud, right? That's the mob mentality. Like don't fall into the trap of mob mentality when it comes to toxicity and negativity. Rather than prove to people that you have a voice and that you can say stuff, prove to people through your work of what you're doing, of what you're providing for people. There are better ways to go about navigating the hobby rather than jumping into the toxicity. I realize I shouldn't keep bringing up toxic things in every vlog episode. As new breeders, you might not be familiar with all the drama behind the scenes. Sometimes it's not even behind the scenes. Sometimes it's very apparent, but it's more of just a warning. Hopefully as you kind of develop and grow, you'll see a lot of things that might rub you the wrong way. When that happens, just put your head down and do the work. Be good to people. More stuff to talk about as always, but I'll end it here. I'll cap it here again. Sorry, we don't have a gecko pod for you guys this week, but we have this vlog. It's probably a poor substitution, but but hopefully for you new breeders, there is some insight and wisdom for you guys to learn as you guys continue to grow. If you have any questions or topics you want to talk about, feel free to DM me on IG, zeros underscore geckos, or you can just leave a comment below in this YouTube video. But keep working hard, enjoy your projects, enjoy your time in the hobby, make the best and the most out of what you're doing, make those connections and friendships and build that community and that base and just continue to grind and do cool stuff, make cool animals. I'll see you guys on the next vlog.